You are now looped into the world of Bam. <laughs> it gets me every time. It gets me every time. Why don't I voice an audiobook, guys? Like, why? Why is this not in the books? Why don't I have a deal, yeah, to voice all of the Agatha books and just ruin them for you? You, you hear my stomach? <laughs> I just had like two fucking jacket potatoes. Not that you care. Not that you care. Another thing that you definitely don't care about, but I'm still gonna tell you is that I feel like I'm gonna need to have like a course on becoming social again. Like every single communication I try to have with like the neighbor or you know in a coffee shop or whatever when ordering stuff. I just leave it and I'm like this was this did not look right. Actually for the first time ever I kind of started to understand why British people resort to small talk so much and it's mostly because they really are going they just don't know how to deal with like social interactions with you know a random ass person like a colleague at work somebody they're not close with I finally get you and it's freaking me out because I'm usually the person who just like comes and asks you you know like oh tell me everything about your life oh your brother is my age oh cool are they hot yeah tell me is your brother hot oh and then people are like oh is your brother hot I'm like that's disgusting I've never seen my brother that way what is this podcast <laughs> Uh, this is probably, by the way, the most light heart this episode will get. Because the case I'm bringing you today is just hard on a whole different level. I've heard about this case a few months ago. Well, it was actually kind of closed shut last year. And I just immediately thought, like, I have to cover this. Like, let's put it on the perspective list. And then I'll either fit it into the themes of the month or just um, cover it in the last episode of the, of the month when I go rogue. So let's just say your blood will boil and you will feel uncomfortable about a lot of things that happened in this case. You will all have different opinions or maybe you will all just agree with me. This is gonna be a hard one. So without further ado, let's just um, dive straight into the motherfucker. 30-year-old police officer Amber Geiger walks into an apartment thinking it was hers on September 6, 2018. She hears commotion inside draws a gun and shoots bottom Jean who dies on the scene. We've got our crime, we have our killer. What were her motives? As the information for this case has been like taken mostly from either the news articles or this one podcast, I kind of want to credit them because they have done like such in-depth work and they kind of keep doing it for everything. So the podcast is called Court Junkie. It just breaks down a trial case per episode and it's just so nicely breaking down. And I just thank them for the work because about 85% of this whole episode is about what they focused on trial. So before going into that, let's just run through what actually happened on this scene. Because when I heard about this, I was like, how does this even? So in short, Amber Geiger left her police shift for that evening. She apparently worked overtime, so she worked over 13 hours that night. She was super tired, but again, not tired enough to keep texting slash sexting. Her partner, well, partner in crime and partner at work, who she had an affair with because he was married, she drives to her apartment block, she parks her car on the wrong level as well. So, you know, like those level parkings. So she parks up on the wrong level without noticing that she has done so. And it's one of those buildings where, you know, the parking level kind of has an entrance that leads to the apartment block, so you can immediately access it through that door. Again, she doesn't realize she is on the wrong floor. She puts the key into the lock. Again, she doesn't realize that the number of the flat is different. And she doesn't realize that the door is kind of ajar. So when she just like even tries to put the key into the lock, the door just opens. And this is when she freaks out. And her immediate thinking is that somebody has entered her house. She draws a gun. According to her, she gives out a warning but who she thinks is the intruder still goes ahead, like goes towards her and she shoots. She still thinking this is her flat. She still thinks that like she just shot her intruder. So she makes a 911 call. As she is on the call with a the person, they ask for like the address. She goes to the front of the flat, like so to the door of the flat, 
realizes that that is not her flat because it's a completely different flat number. And during this call, she just keeps repeating that she thought it was her apartment. She says it 19 fucking times during this call. 1478, yes. I'm an off-duty officer. I thought it was in my apartment. And I shot a guy thinking that he was... Thinking it was my apartment. He shot someone? Yes, I thought it was my apartment. I'm fucked. Oh my god. I'm sorry. Okay, and where, where are you at right now? I'm in... Uh, what do you mean? I'm inside the apartment with him. Hey, come on. What's your name? I'm Amber Geiger. I need to get me. I'm... I'm in... Okay, we have help on the way. I know, but uh-huh. I'm... I'm gonna lose my job. I thought it was my apartment. If nobody asked me to remove that part for copyright, uh, that is her 911 call. And if they do, you can listen to it online. Just after listening to it, the first couple of things that you can pinpoint straight away is that she just gives a fuck about herself and that will turn out to be a pattern. So she's saying shit like, I'm gonna lose my job. I thought it was my apartment. I mean, she says it 19 times. I'm obviously not gonna play like... And she says it 19 times in the span of like five minute call. In the meantime, what you don't hear her saying is like... She asked at the beginning of the call, I didn't play that, for both the ambulance and the police. But what she doesn't keep saying is like, hey, the guy is breathing, hey, I'm gonna try CPR. She does not give a fuck about this person being intruder or not. Also towards the end of the call, she keeps repeating how she's tired. Again, the guy is dying next to you. Why are you putting 911 call on a speakerphone? Then trying to like resuscitate the person, like, what are you doing? You're a police officer. The police eventually come and 26-year-old Bottom Jean has been given CPR on the scene and he dies during the transport to the hospital. Now, sort of what roughly happened here, just like in short, they live adjacent to each other. So like, he lives in apartment 1478, she lives right underneath him in 1378. So of course the trial testimonies and everything is going to pinpoint like all of these points. So from what she has done prior to finishing her shift, to her driving to her home, to the parking, to her like opening the door, like her motives behind the shooting or the lack thereof, not realizing it is her own apartment, whether she gave a warning or not, was he even like trying to confront her or like how was he coming at her, so like the bullet trajectory, did she or did she not try to actually help him and give first aid, but why this case got me? Because I just immediately went into like the imagine this mode. This is how I try to present most of the cases. Like picture this, feel it on your own skin. And then I realized like when I was even trying to think about it, it's like, yes, I can imagine myself sitting in my own flat, minding my own business. He was just sitting on the couch, eating ice cream and watching TV. In a sense, I can imagine that happening to me but it is so so far away it's shielded by so many walls of white privilege that even though i can imagine it happening it is so like far from reality whereas it is reality for the whole of the black community and i kind of feel like we need to start acknowledging that because nobody should fear just sitting at home chilling watching tv minding their own business in their own flat not doing anything at all for somebody to just take their life away for nothing. Similar thing happened to Brianna Taylor. Like she had like been attacked within her own flat again on the no-knock search warrant where they just like shot her. Her like shooter doesn't even isn't even serving in prison. They just like the newest thing is that they have been fired from police force. I'm sorry. Like, do you know how many serial killers we know that they have just been fired and what somebody else will hire them. They're just gonna continue doing this. Again in the hands of white people. Or the case of Stephen Lawrence, who was killed by the these white kids while just walking down the street again with his friend. That's why I'm saying like it is so even far beyond what you can imagine as a white person as your reality versus what is imposed on the whole black community where nobody should just be walking down the street having in the back of their head that they can be just stopped out of nothing, like stop out of nowhere and just beaten to death. Or this case pushes it even further because it is somebody just within their flat that they freaking paid for, that they have the right to be in and to just be relaxed and be feel safe. Somebody just goes into your home and kills you in your own four walls. This is why like with this case, I really, 
I wanted to again take it from that imagine this angle. What I'm saying is that it is so far beyond something that should even be imagined and yet it is reality for so many people. And the consequences for such an act are so appalling. So let's just dive straight into the consequences or the trial section of this. I'm gonna try to make this, you know, prosecution defense, prosecution defense, to make it interesting. Maybe, I hope so. God, this case makes me sweat. Okay. <laughs> so the prosecution starts with, like, obviously the build-up and, like, let's start from your shift. Let's start from what happened. You know, what got you so twisted, so carried away that you actually didn't realize you were walking into your into the wrong apartment. So they're like, huh, she had an affair with this partner called Martin Rivera who she made plans with after that shift. And this is when they're like, okay, so you said you were tired. Yeah, remember the 911 call when you said how you were tired? So you see how you made plans even though you were tired? And they showcase all of the messages between them that kind of go against her tiredness because she's sexting with him as she leaves the station, saying how horny she is and sending him a snap, like of herself, Asking wanna touch. This makes me wanna vomit in my fucking mouth considering what happens later. Even if she didn't go into the wrong flat and kill the person. This is just people, the lovers that are trying, listen, the side chicks that are trying to keep the married man interested just have it all wrong in their heads. It's just, this is not how it works, but okay. It's like, what have you seen in your childhood? What movies have you watched that made you think like, this is how you're supposed to live? Like, this is totally, you know, not gonna cause you to self-hate and, you know, think about yourself as like this great human fucking being. Now, when I first heard this, I was like, okay, cool. In her defense, again, not trying to sound like I'm defending her, definitely not. Thinking if it was me and I was like tired, but like still trying to, you know, like in my whole days, in my hoeing days, like still trying to be like, oh yeah, like horny, whatever, I would not send that kind of shit, but... It might have been that she was just trying to keep it cool, you know, and like act cool and keep it all fresh with her fling. But boy, was it an unfortunate timing, girl. Was it an unfortunate timing if you were really trying to do that? But then also, if you are really shattered, you have had like 13 something hours of shift, you wouldn't even be thinking about that. You would just drop it completely and just be like, yeah, fuck it, like, I'm gonna go home, hit the bed. When have you ever been like that fucking tired and been like, you know what? that dick like <laughs> now i'm gonna get the comments like maya you haven't been dick tonight like you don't know what the good dick is like bitch i just want to sleep okay <laughs> especially in that side chick relationship okay you want to have good sex you don't want to have tired sex i'm milking this because the rest of the case is depressing yes yes i am i'm taking any light chance to fucking roast this whole side chick relationship as much as i can so, not just that they are sexting, but like as she's driving home, they're on a phone call for about 16 minutes. This is again when she's that distracted that she fails to park on the floor. She's supposed to, again, failing to realize it's the wrong parking area. And this is what they find weird and what they take apart because one of the parking areas was apparently like on an open floor and one isn't. So like, how is she not realizing this is a completely different parking area that she parks at every single day? And now they're like, okay, so this is like the map of the building. You were to walk about a minute or two, passing 16 different apartments. Then you can see a lit up sign with the apartment number. And not just that, but Bo's apartment had this bright red floor mat. This is what they are like, come on. Even if by that point you don't realize that this is completely wrong floor, wrong everything. You know, you're stepping onto a floor mat. Like all of, all of your senses should be present. Like you should see it, you should step on it. You should like feel it underneath your feet even before you put a key into that fob. And then they take apart her 911 call, which we, as we already heard, they're like, yep. So she said, from what you can hear during this 911 call, she gives a fuck only about herself. She said 19 times that she thought it was her own apartment. Why would somebody say that many times unless they're e immediately planning? This is recorded. This is going to go on the record, like on my trial. Let me just try to save my ass, even like remotely, which if you would try to fake that you're helping the person next to the victim because then that can be heard on that one one call that can then go into your favor no nope, nope ever just like nothing no great 
And then they discover that during this 911 call, not just that she isn't helping Bo, but she texts Martin saying, I need you. And then followed by that, I fucked up. First of all, that's an understatement if I've ever seen one. Like, I fucked up is something you say, like, if you lose a wallet and, like, your ID is in the wallet and you're like, oh my god, I fucked up, like, I dropped it, I don't know where it is. It's not like, oh, I went into the wrong apartment and killed a person, I fucked up. That's a whole different level. What prosecution then goes to tear apart is the fact that only those texts are actually available. They deleted the rest of the texts. So, of course, like, some of them, like, those sexting ones have been recovered, but then... I don't know if they couldn't recover some of them or they just didn't present them. Later on in the trial, they're gonna question them both on why they have deleted these texts. But now, nah, let's go to defense. Defense takes a stand. No, she takes a stand and defense has a turn. I don't know the trial terms, okay? What do you expect from me? Her whole defense team, their whole argument, is that she had no choice but to use her gun to keep herself from dying. And she keeps repeating on the stand that she thought Bo was a threat. And the whole strategy for the defense, okay, if this doesn't like make your blood boil, the whole strategy for the defense is to obviously, they have to show her character. So it's like, hey, it's actually a nice person, no, la di da di da, like she didn't mean to do this, look at that, there was no like premeditation, she didn't have a history of all of this shit. Right, so they said that she wanted to be a cop to catch the bad guys, and then they're like, oh, you know, that affair just neglect that, her affair with Martin had nothing to do with it, which again thinking from the defense point of view is a shitty defense because, hear me out, not defending her, but I'm just like thinking about all these things, I'm like, you're not playing it right. We all know she's gonna get like the shittiest sentence and there's not gonna be justice. So, let me just say it. Like, how does this affair not go into the whole character description? Because, also the thing is, they could have played those I need you and I fucked up messages to her favor saying that she knew what she did was wrong, but this is what they choose to do, being like, ignore this whole affair thing. Nobody's gonna ignore it already, so you might as well like play it into your favor. And then they say the prosecution didn't actually show the message saying that she was sleepy, they just chose, you know, a selective amount of messages that go into your favor, but then they're like, but yeah, but then you choose what goes into your favor. Do you not understand how trials work? They play the tiredness card, of course, so they say she requested the next day off, she worked the 13-hour shift, and then she worked 40 hours within the four days before the incident, that her meeting Martin after work was just a speculation to begin with, and that they engaged into like this flirtatious banter all the time. First of all, flirtatious banter, oh god, what are you, like, my mom, like, do your parents also have the words for, like, fucking, that they just try to twist it so that it doesn't sound like that dramatic and that sexual and, like, whatever expression they try to use is just 20 times worse. <laughs> so, the defense is, like, she was on autopilot because of how tired she was, as the door opens without turning the handle, she immediately just like thinks it's an intruder. Then the next bit obviously has to be like, okay, she entered the flat and Bo was actually a threat, yeah? They need to prove that Bo was actually a fucking threat, was an intruder. She was justified to think so. The actual like bullet trajectory or whatever the fuck they call it shows that he literally dropped the ice cream on the table, stood up and it was in the position of like, you know, when you're moving from the couch towards the door, so you're in that position of getting up and just moving while getting up. Whereas her whole defense states that he was actually lowering down. And I'm like, did you ever watch Dexter? I mean, I know that this is blood spatter and this is bullet trajectory, but like, CSI, bitch. Also, can we just for a second talk about... Listen, can we just for a second talk about how Dexter had one of the shittiest endings shittiest endings, books, both books and the series, of course, because it's fucking based on those books, right? But we still don't hate it like as much as we did the Game of Thrones ending. I put true crime, it works. <laughs> and then we are back onto the trial. <sighs> the defense is like, we are holding her to an impossible standard. Please explain this to me. She is a cop, like, she should be held to some standard. Just even like a common decent human being standard where she doesn't just suppose that somebody's gonna attack her. She gives warnings before even drawing her gun. She maybe doesn't actually draw the gun until another person, like, 
all of this shit is just like be actually shoot before the other person actually shows up their fucking face and she realizes they're not a threat at all she maybe shows some empathy and gives this person a cpr tries to revive them no that would be impossible of a standard now they put martin on the stand and this is my favorite thing in this whole fucking trial okay because first of all first of all, I, I just break the down i'm gonna roast these two motherfuckers it's it's my life this is this is my life's mission to like roast people that like fucking have affairs okay because just for anybody out there thinking like affair is a good thing just think about that because first of all they never end up well but just think about the worst possible scenario are you ready to go into the affair where you dirty laundry everything about that affair might actually go to trial one day and then you're not just like an embarrassment to your wife and family and kids no like your whole fucking town your whole world knows about your business yep are you are you ready to do you accept those terms and conditions please proceed go and fuck a side chick i put in the script do you love your side chick how about now <laughs> she has a murder charge do you still love her how about now so we're back kind of like with the prosecution and they grill martin obviously he says like oh you know she just had like a normal day you know like it's it's she yeah she works those long hours every time martin just like yeah let's throw this bitch under the fucking bus he also lies about when the affair ended like it's clearly it hasn't ended but okay what she said about the text is that she doesn't know why she deleted her text again great defense great defense. just plead the fifth then bitch like what are we on about but he says he deleted them not to stay reminded of that night oh my god this is so deep like this is so tragic he cannot live with this night this night was so traumatic for him bitch please man died but then after that he says also he doesn't keep the messages that are of no importance to him he's literally like shading like putting some shade on this relationship was like yeah you fucked up my life i'm on trial now i'm gonna be exposed go fuck yourself camber now they show the body camera footage which shows that she was outside like when the police came to the flat after the 911 call and she's just again not, it's not like 19 times was enough she still keeps repeating that she thought it was her apartment but like we got it bitch we got it this is your defense that you do not care about no human life we got it can we just like get to the person to actually help them out we, we don't care about you right now and also why does the body camera show her outside why is she not desperately trying to help the victim inside on the scene they find the bowl of ice cream the tv screen is on and they're like earbuds next to him so he might he probably just heard the commotion you know started getting up to see who the hell is getting into his apartment but again no weapon no nothing like he wasn't actually like in any sense way or form a threat to her so next they obviously they break that down so 911 call the police comes to the flat body camera all of that footage all of those texts everything obviously we're like okay cool so how was well that crime scene preserved and then what was happening with her well she's clearly a criminal here so what is the police doing with her what kind of treatment are they giving her you you can guess where this is going sergeant valentine actually testifies that first of all amber appeared to be on her phone so she removes Ember from the scene, but again, Ember is not immediately arrested. No, she's not like handcuffed. She's like, yeah, chill, you have, you finish your conversation. Like, what kind of treatment would you give to anybody? Random fucking person who you would find the same situation? Oh, because it's a police officer. No, please, take your time, finish your phone call, make sure you say your goodbyes. So Sergeant Valentine goes to like bring her car closer to the entrance, something along those fucking lines, leaves Ember like there on her phone, like she could technically flee completely just fucking run the fuck out and when she comes back amber is surrounded with four other officers she's just like talking to them chilling you know like just like chatting about shit like this is you know a normal day like she is at somebody else's crime scene not her own so standard practice should be that obviously the suspect the suspect is confined so that the stories can't be changed fabricated one can influence the other so those police officers can give her like some other details or can just be biased and tell her how to save her own ass and again she can say something that then can be used against her when she goes into that car okay so there's another deviation of course with everything in this case it's just a shit show she's aware obviously there is in car camera so another officer who was superior to sergeant sergeant valentine asked for it to, to be turned off to get Amber 
like out of the camera view and just chat with her. And well, he was a superior to the sergeant, so she does that. And she says she did it because she thought Amber was on duty and she just wanted to speak to her supervisor. And just, if you didn't guess, so far she's still on her phone. She's not handcuffed, nope, she's just chilling because the sergeant thinks like this is her crime scene or something, that she's still on shift. And everybody's kind of acting that way as well. Defense here jumps in and says like none of this was in her control, she didn't ask for any of it. Like finally they actually fucking take her and arrest her, but this was just fucking peak. Now when they have all of this obviously broken down from the actual crime scene, they start calling witnesses to the stands. So they have a witness from 1437, Joshua Brown, who says he heard two separate voices. So he was in the apartment next door. So he said he heard two separate voices, but they sounded like they were meeting each other with surprise. He doesn't hear, show me your hands, nothing similar to that. He gets freaked out when he hear hears the shots, runs back into the garage, waits for two minutes, then walks into his apartment and two, three minutes later sees Amber coming out of Joe's apartment on her phone. So this is her calling 911. Which again, it's what, two, three minutes past? She just walks out to call 911. It's like, yeah, but I just walk around, calm myself down while there's a person bleeding on the floor regular police procedure. I'm trying to pinpoint that this defines Amber's character more than anything in this freaking story. There's another witness who is Robaldo Jones and he parked and saw Amber there, so he like saw her from the parking spot area. So he remembers seeing a white pickup truck driving super fast from there and then backing into parking space near, he is the police officer who goes into the flat and then he hears gunshots and her repeating, there was someone in my apartment again. What you don't hear is her giving any warning signs. Other neighbors also testified they didn't hear any noise or verbal commands before the shots. Now the defense, defense tries to serve these facts, which is just like so bizarre and somehow actually funny in this case. It's just, listen, they tried, okay, they, they fucking tried. So they're like, so the police officer who was first on the scene, remember, remember, you know, like just forget about the body cam, forget that she was outside and chilling, whatever. No, the police officer said that the layout of the flat is actually the same. There's no like clear indicator of the floors either, just like a small placard, so like you can't even sort of just immediately see what floor you're on. And they're like, no, let me hit you up with stats. So they have done this survey. I don't know, have th has this been done before or after, but they use these stats, which are just so weak. And I'm like, this was so pointless, but yeah, let's share it. Basically surveyed 200, well, out of 329 people that live there, they surveyed 297 and 15% of them walked into the wrong apartment at one point or another. Let's unpack that. First of all, what the fuck? Why is anybody walking into the wrong apartments in this particular building? How is this built? Why are all of them looking the same? How are they walking into them? Do people just leave their doors open? Probably not after this. But also, 15%. That's your stats. Even 50 plus would be like, mm, 15%. I swear, during this whole court procedure, the defense strategy was just like, okay, so she, the character testimonies are just not existent. We cannot really shed like some great light onto her character. So what we're gonna do is just try to like take this whole thing apart and just focus how this affair wasn't like that relevant to her. You know, how nothing of that mattered in this case. And just be like, yeah, yeah, she tried, she tried to show empathy, she was there, she was present, look, 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 she tried to do compressions. So they proceed to say that Amber's plan was never for Martin to come to hers, because, like, he's apparently never been to her flat in the first place. Again, that defense, cool, you could have given him an address, but okay. And that long call that they have had was about the robbery bus that they had, like, earlier that day. After that, she goes into Bo's flat. She says she not, not just that she commanded, she yelled at him and he was saying hey, hey, hey and moving towards her. Again, very threatening. Somebody you just walked into their flat and they're saying hey, hey, hey. On the stand she testifies, she said let me see your hands, which we know is bullshit because of every witness testimony. Then she goes to say she was doing compressions. Again, we have witnesses saying she's roaming about the fucking flat complex. And not just that, but I think like nobody really focused the moment the police is there 
the ambulance is there. People, other people are trying to revive Bo on the floor. She's just like, yeah, cool, let me just go finish my phone call, man. Like, yeah, Sergeant Valentine, yeah, take me away. Also, don't handcuff me or anything. But yeah, let's just flee this fucking scene. It's never, it's never happened. Let's just focus on myself. How am I defending myself? Woman. She says she was texting Martin as she was feeling alone and that she deleted them because she felt ashamed. So afterwards, like, she's changed to, like, not knowing why she deleted them, probably depressed her. And she was like, oh, yeah, I felt ashamed. Dude, you never said, like, you feel ashamed for killing a person. Like, it's just the moral compass is different. And the persecution guy is just my man. He's just, like, not buying into all of this. He's, like, taking it a fucking apart. So he's like, oh, so you say how um, you were scared as fuck? Yeah. So imagine the guy that actually lived in his own fucking flat, in his own four walls, and was just attacked and uh, shot at his home. He would be a little bit more scared than you, wouldn't you? And she breaks down, like, bitch. This is when, as a juror, I'd be like, case closed, case closed. Closing statements, move it, let's go, guilty, maximum sentence. And he just again goes into, like, ripping her apart because she, he says, you're very aware of how you feel. You can't relate to how he must have felt in the last moments of his life, though, don't you? Also, there's footage out there. She breaks down in court multiple times. She's just like, oh my god, like, like he was a threat. He was a threat. Very into repeating fucking shit. This is probably how she studied as when she was younger as well. <sighs> To draw onto my one and only court experience, I was kind of like, what's that thing called, you know, the thing that Amber didn't have in court? Character witnesses. Yeah. <laughs> I was that for, like, my friend in her case. Basically, I'm not gonna specify about what it is, because I don't want people asking me, like, who the fuck it was and what it was about, privacy reasons. Okay. But yeah, basically, I was in court and it's not comfortable, let me say, and even it's not even like I was... You know, it was just like a witness. It's not like even they were grilling me. And the defense was just fucking nasty. And from everything I've seen, like from the court recordings and stuff, like they weren't even that mean to her. She had special treatment from the get-go in this freaking case. And she's there being all fucking dramatic on the stand. Again, because she only cares to save herself and to have as little of that sentence as she humanly can. The cherry on the top in this case is like, who prepared, first of all, who prepared this woman for the stand? She says she tried to do a little CPR. Please define a little CPR. She couldn't fully commit to CPR. I mean, she can't commit to relationships, she can't fully commit to police work. Why did we think she can fully commit to CPR, guys? Because why can she not commit to CPR? She is on the phone. Honest to God, like, if I'm a juror, I'm done. I am so done. Like, I don't even listen after this. Again, speakerphones. This is current situation. It's like you have smartphones. You can be on the 911 call and try to do CPR. You can ask them to walk you through how to do CPR. And the prosecutor is just like, oh, so uh, what you are saying is you put your needs before his. Slap. Bam. Done. And that's the whole point. She didn't know he was gonna die. And she still just thought about herself. There was no blood on her or on the shoes where like anything it would be if she was in the proximity, if she was kneeling down, if she was actually trying to fucking help. And I think so far you have heard like so many things being taken apart and the lack of what she's saying is as important as what she is like owning up to. She never says that she's sorry. She does not show fuck all remorse. She has her last chance to like own up where they speak about like the bullet trajectory that he was just getting up. He wasn't even like crouching down. He wasn't even like in the position ready to attack anything. Didn't have a weapon. Didn't have nothing. This is like your last chance to own up, to have like show some guilt, show some remorse. Nothing. Now before going to closing statements, I feel like everybody will kind of, well, want me to cover this, but also will wonder why the race card wasn't as prevalent here, for example, or why it like wasn't played by the prosecution as much. And I feel it's because there was the lack of and just because of what the whole crime is. It's about proving whether or not she thought the guy posed a threat and that was like the whole premise of it versus like whether she has actually seen, I don't know, the color of the skin, 
whether she has had time to actually judge on it and then like shoot because of that. Which could have been a missed opportunity, I don't really know, like I would like to know what you think, but obviously in court they show these texts between her and Martin and they are basically like chatting about other colleagues, so about like the situation at work. Oh no, he says, not racist, but I'm here with these different black officers. She responds, not racist, but just have a different way of working and it shows. Should we just all agree? Whoever says no racist in a sentence, you just know immediately that's a fucking racist motherfucker. If you start a sentence with not racist, you just know you're dealing with a freaking racist motherfucker. You just get out of there. Like, there's no even point. But pretty much, I think it was that in like another text with like another one of her colleagues trying to show that maybe there were some like racial intentions here as well that should be looked into. But from the whole breakdown and all of the sources, I don't think that that was pushed enough. So again, not sure what was the choice there, as in, like, did they not think there was enough there because of the nature of the case and because they were just focusing on, like, yeah, let's show that she is actually guilty because, well, she didn't say, you know, there's stuff that we can prove, like, she didn't give any verbal commands, like, why did she think it was her block of apartments? So further stronger pieces of evidence rather than just those texts that in this particular circumstance might not like have as much weight. In the closing arguments, prosecution, like just prosecutor just calls Amber's testimony garbage. This guy really had it out for her. I gotta give this to this guy. This guy earned his fucking paycheck on that trial. He says this was a series of unreasonable decisions instead of a mistake and I fucking agree with him. I, I gotta. Because again, there was plenty of steps where you could have stopped this, where you could have actually waited to see if the person has had the weapon, like, was actually posing a threat, could have actually hear you saying, like, I don't know, put your hands up. And he says the law against the intruders is in place for Bo and not for her. The Vance's closing statement is to say that only what happened after she opened the door matters. So mistakes can be made, let's not judge her on her relationships, which just doesn't make sense because, like, okay, if we are not judging her on her relationships, then, like, we can't judge her on her tiredness either, so why was that involved if we are judging her only on what happened after she opened that fucking door? Also, if we are judging her only on what happened after she opened the door, should she know her procedure as a police officer as well? And according to witnesses, that didn't seem to be the procedure that she has followed. The jury comes back after two hours and a half. Of course, that means guilty, but... but... (laughs) You're gonna hate okay, this case. This this whole drill down to this verdict, okay? I am laughing in a fucking nervous fit. I'm sweating and dying inside. The maximum offered was 99 years, out of which they have given her 10 years. 10 years. You make out of that as you wish. Do I think it's enough? No. I think it's yet again special treatment that any other reasonable, per- like any other person committing that kind of crime would not have gotten, but because she's a police officer, she does. What I found interesting is that actually, because I looked up, because obviously when I saw this, I was like, okay, these jurors must be like white, privileged, whatever middle class. Out of 12 jurors, five were black, five were Hispanic or Asian, and two were white. So do I understand this? I truly don't. It's like minority. It's like, I know it's not racially intending crime, in which case they would have probably given her more, but then... It's like, this is your time to shine. This is your time to, like, actually make a rational, like, reasonable fucking decision that's proportionate to the crime. Prosecutors actually asked for 28 years based on the age Jean would have attained had he been alive today, which, fair, more than 10 at least. And then there is this just heartbreaking thing that's shown online on the news everywhere where, like, Jean's brother... Brant Jean said on the stand, like, he forgives her and he doesn't want her to go to jail, he wants the best for her, because he knows that's exactly what Bo would have wanted. And then, like, he asks the judge, can he hug her? And he just, like, hugs her in, in the court and everybody's kind of, like, judging him on this and being like, how can you, like, forgive the person that murdered your brother? Which, for that part, I can understand, because it's, like, Okay, if the family decides to forgive her, that's on them, that's their closure, that's them moving on. At least she was given some sentence, they can now, you know, move on, leave this part, like, in the past and remember Bo for, like, who he was 
before this sentence. For what I don't understand is that the judge in this case then also embraces Geiger and gives her a Bible. It's like, judge, okay, first of all, chill, what the fuck, what is this bias? But also, you're not, it's not like you gave her her own autobiography, mate. She's not, you think she's gonna read up a Bible? It's not about her and her life story and how she is a victim in a story. Why would she read that? Sorry, that doesn't go into her argument. Okay, the trial is done. The trial is done. And the fun fact that doesn't fit anywhere, but it just has to be fucking mentioned, is that Ember is actually in the same prison where Yolanda Saliver is. And Yolanda Saliver is the person that killed Selena. And I'm gonna research this one day, but just listen to this. Listen why I haven't researched this. It's just because Yolanda has the most fucking disturbing voice. It's that voice that you hear and immediately feel fucking goosebumps. This is what I would have to endure, okay? This is her 911 call. Listen to this bitch. I forgive myself. Yolanda. You're talking about the only friend you ever had. Who was that? <laughs> That's my only friend. Is my friend. only friend. What was your only friend's name? I don't want to tell you. You don't want to tell me? No, but it was my only friend. Yeah, this is what I'm on about. <laughs> But again, in my head, as you know, like my head immediately goes to me thinking about what conversations Amber and Yolanda would be having in prison. I can just imagine them both in the canteen, these two having the most boring conversations where they just keep repeating themselves. So like Yolanda would be like, I didn't kill her, I didn't kill her. And then Amber would be like, he was a threat. I thought it was my apartment and everybody would just be like eating that fucking shitty canteen food being like why? Why do I have to endure this? Prison is punishment enough. Like how are these two creatures in the exact same fucking prison? Just wanted to share that fun fact with you because this is what goes into my head when I research. You know, I immediately check who is in the same prison and then like imagine conversations they would have in my head. It makes me feel better about myself somehow. I don't understand it either. <laughs> okay, moving on. Now let's uh, go into the background for both Bo and Amber and see what we can piece together there. So, Amber Geiger, background, let's do this quickly, cause fuck her. Cool, she attended schools, she graduated, she was with Dallas Police Department for four years before the incident. This relationship with Martin Rivera lasted a year at most, the kink was sending each other sexual messages, so it wasn't even like that the kink was fucking, which is just such a pointless affair. Just this whole affair is the most pointless fucking bit, like, why do you get yourself into a fucking affair with a married man if your kink is just the sexual messages? Then find a single man, you freak, find a perv on the internet. The jury also heard, like, after the trial from her mother and sister that her normally upbeat and outgoing personality faded as she expressed her regret and the desire to have traded places with Mr. Jean. It's a great, it's just, okay, so where was this, where was this empathy, where was this uh, remorse before the trial? No, you're just fucking playing for the parole board. Stop selling bullshit now. It's like, listen, if this was your first, first thing that came out of your fucking mouth, if you have showed it in action on the crime scene, and then have said it during the court, during the trial. You have pl plenty of time to say this shit. No, you're just saying it now in prison when somebody was like, maybe it would be a fucking good idea to start showing feelings, to start saying you're feeling feelings, you know, just for the parole board, just so you get out of here even earlier than fucking 10 years. She was actually in the police, the part of the elite critical response team, or CRT, of about 10 officers who would make high-risk arrests in the division's crime hotspots. Which again, also, if somebody knows, because I couldn't actually find this anywhere, could she even after the prison sentence? I, I would assume that the answer to this is no. I really hope the answer to this is no. But like, after the prison sentence, can she be a police officer again? This is probably a dumb question and I truly hope that the answer is no. But then it kind of wouldn't surprise me if the answer would be yes. Unfortunately, this is a fucked up world. So, whereas she had her mom and sister and, uh, you know, maybe her lover to kind of, like, testify to her character, Bo actually had, like, a whole fucking community built. And he was just this fun-loving person who always saw a bright side to everything. His birthday was actually coming up and, like, he was watching an NFL football game because he was really into that. So, like, when she broke into his flat, he was watching the football game on TV while eating ice cream. What I actually didn't mention about the trial, just because I feel like it is so, like, disrespectful that they even brought this in. And it was just, like, no reason but to fucking shame his character. It was like, his character is not 
who is on stand here, he is a victim here, like why would we even brought this in? It was sort of like trying to prove like Amber should have known that this was the wrong flat because it had like a smell of weed. I mean, Amber didn't fucking have all any of her senses apparently that night, so why would have this had been prevalent? She didn't feel the freaking or see the red rug, so clearly the smell of weed apparently wouldn't have meant anything to her. So again, kind of like, why bring it in? So his family actually had to say, like, that he had ADHD and he would, like, smoke weed to calm himself down. Which again, like, you don't even have to go through this. So his whole family is St. Lucian, um, they came to the US, he actually studied accounting at Harding University, after which he went to work for PwC in downtown Dallas, and both PwC and Harding Uni published like statements after he was murdered to like testify to his character and to sort of like express some condolences to the family as well. He was really involved in like the community church. He worked as a resident assistant, ran for like student body president at his uni as well. Apart from that, like also mentored the men's group and led the worship sessions in his church every chance he got. He apparently had this lovely voice, would speak during the sermons, during the mass as well. But also led a teaching ministry. They all say that they, um, the young adults in that community, like really struggled come back together after losing him as a leader he was in every single source that i have read like described that he would be such a great potential leader just because again he was not condescending he was just like this loving human who knew how to make people unite in like a really positive way and as if this wasn't enough like he would also volunteer on the side he dreamt of doing mission work in Nairobi, where he previously funded non-profit work. He'd also organized games and activities for children in St. Lucia orphanages. So just throughout his whole fucking life. He's just solid character through and through, whose life just ended because of no fucking reason. Now let's discuss the motives. So here I know some of you will probably even think like why was this even structured that way, why are we even discussing the motives, you know, this might not have been motivated at all. To which I can sort of like see your point as well, like, I mean, but even then the motives would have either been like mistaken identity, you know, she thinking like somebody is an intruder when they're not, or just the fear, you know, she saying that yeah, he's a threat to her life. According to her, that's what, well, motivated her to draw the gun and follow some police procedure that only she knew about, apparently. I think what they didn't dig hard enough, as hard enough as they should into, I feel like there was something more to this, as in whether she was on edge, whether because of something that happened on that shift, but I think even more prevalently, because she only started sort of acting on autopilot when she was on the phone like to her boo you know while she was driving back home so whether it was something that happened there you know all of these texts that have disappeared what was on that phone call like why was that phone call never played that made her like completely kind of lose her touch like lose the touch with herself and just not follow the police procedure at all and i think what further goes into not the motivation, but the aftermath of it, was that even if you think this was motivated by fear, this was mistaken identity case, even then she is kind of like just expressed her narcissism throughout this whole court, this whole trial. So I have a feeling like different people are going to have different opinions here, whether you're going to think like it's not motivated at all, it's just a stupid mistake, or you're going to go to the whole other spectrum where you will just probably think this was actually motivated by race, and whether if this was a white man in the exact same circumstances, would she have shot him? If this was, I don't know, a police officer, would the outcome still be the same? And that's the part that unfortunately we will never know unless she owns up to it. And it's probably in her best interest not to own up to it. Whether she actually even had the time to see Bo, like as in, it, did she even have like seconds to a knowledge this person to a knowledge was he even a threat, to a knowledge even like was he coming at her and to a knowledge his race. And that's probably gonna die deep within Amber Geiger. Because whatever she was to say on that would probably not go into her favor. Also what I found interesting is in the end this case stood apart from other examples across the country in which police officers have been cleared of wrongdoings in the death of unarmed black men. And she was the first Dallas police officer to be convicted of murder since the 1973 murder of Santos Rodriguez. 
And I mean, if that doesn't tell you everything about the justice system in the US, and just in general, the special treatment that the police officers get, I don't fucking know what does. It's not only the fact that it's the first police officer to be convicted in what? I'm trying to do math in my head. 47 years, or well, it was last year, so 46 years. But that even that conviction is only 10 years, so what it tells you is just basically encouraging police officers to do this crime because at best they're gonna get a slap on the wrist, like they will most probably not be convicted and even if they do, their sentence is just gonna be petty. I know the family of Bo wouldn't want me to even think this just because they're a lot more forgiving and a lot better people than I fucking ever will be but I know and hope that she is probably getting the shittiest time in prison just because she is a police officer and we all know how they look up on these people in there. Just all the black aunties, you just know they're having a fucking blast. They're literally like, oh, you haven't been, honey, you haven't seen it all. The sources for this podcast have been Core the Junkie, Dallas News, AJC Article, The Guardian, The New York Times, and Heavy.com. And now we move on to a very, very light story because I knew you needed this after this whole fucking case. So, Today, have you ever heard about the frog prince? Yeah, 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 let's do this. Choice for this story is just gold. I just had to do this because like when I started reading it, well, well, when I researched these fucking fairy tales slash children's stories for you, I, no, I first read the new version, then I read like the old one. And I'm like, mm, is it fun enough here? As soon as I read the old version, I was like, what the actual fuck am I reading, okay? <laughs> So the frog prince story that you probably know, it's the one where, you know, the she kisses a frog and he becomes a prince. Okay, there's more to it, okay? Listen, this is deeper than you might have thought. <laughs> the morals of these stories are just the next level, okay? This is what our childhood was, okay? Let's cry all together. Of course, I have, like, lines from these because I'm a professional. I take this very seriously. <clears throat> so this is the new version, right? <laughs> mm-hmm. The frog said, I do not want your pearls and jewels and fine clothes, but if you will love me and let me live with you and eat from off your golden plate, okay, <laughs> and sleep in your bed, I will bring you your bowl again. Basically, this fucking princess, right? She's just like playing by this pond. She drops her bowl and this frog is blackmailing her. This is what's happening. This is the plot of this fucking story. <laughs> And then she's like, okay, cool, I want my ball back. But then, what she fucking doesn't realize is that this frog is a stalker. Again, why we teach these kids? It's great, it's great. <laughs> so this frog fucking follows Princess around. But then, he like, kind of knocks on her door or whatever, crowds, croaks. What is the sound that frog is make in front of her door? He probably doesn't knock, does he? <laughs> and then her dad like, opens the door because like, she doesn't want to let him in. She's kind of like, freaked out. It's a fucking frog is talking her, you know. So, but the dad says that she needs to keep her integrity because she basically promised this frog, you know, one thing for another. The frog is blackmailing your kid, okay? And why he needs to do this is because he tells her he's been enchanted by the spiteful fairy who had changed him into a frog. So because of her dad, she leaves him, like, she lets him in, you know, and after, within those couple of days when he bosses her around, he convinces her to kiss him, and then he turns into a prince and then tells her that this has all been because he has been enchanted by a spiteful fairy who had changed him into a frog. He has been, like, forced to abide, like, because, you know, until some princess should just, you know, like, I don't know, cook for him, respect him, like, let him eat her off her plate and sleep upon her bed for three nights. Why is everything in, like, any fairy tale and just childhood story happening in freeze? Did you notice that? Like, Ariel, Little Mermaid, everything is happening in freeze. Like, why is the deadline always three days? What the fuck? Like, did they just, like, no? Okay, you know, <laughs> They have like 90 day fiance now, they're like, no, no, this is too much, okay? If you really fall for somebody, it will happen within the first three days. What the fuck bottle of water? <laughs> Jesus, I'm talking here. The ending of the modern story is that they leave the king. <laughs> it's just like, yeah, thanks for the advice, dad, now bye. Get into this coach with eight horses and set out, full of joy and merriment for the prince's kingdom. <laughs> and this is the best ending of a story that I have ever seen because it says, which they reached safely and there they had lived happily a great many years. 
I loved it not happily ever after. It's just like, oh, they lived happily for a couple of years and then they fucking started fighting and they divorced, okay? Fuck it, modern day. We're still not selling the dreams to the kids of happily ever after, nah. So the moral of this story, I guess, is like stick to your promises and then you're gonna be rewarded, something along those lines. Let stalkers into your life, especially they're frogs. Yeah, animals sh should definitely be allowed to stalk you. What the fuck? <laughs> Now Brothers Grimm come to play, they were like, no, 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 this is better, listen to this, 1812. This wasn't even called the Frog Prince, no, they had <laughs> this title. And this character in this story is completely relevant and I love it so much. Brothers Grimm constantly, just never failed to surprise, never failed to fucking enchant me, okay. <laughs> Did I just translate and cantar? It's like, en encantan, okay, modales, por favor, okay. <laughs> So, this story was called The Frog King or Iron Heinrich. So here, Princess is disinterested, but the Frog Prince continues to court her until he is upon her in her bed. Okay, this is like, not just a stalking level, this frog is like, I'm gonna rape this bitch, listen. Princess throws him against the wall. And this aggressive act turns him, <laughs> turns this frog into a prince. There's just so much to unpack and it's so wrong, but it's so fucking right, okay? Well, up until now, okay? Don't let frogs rape you or anybody. And there's an alternative version where the princess chops off frog's head and leaves him bloody and nearly dead. This too converts the frog into a prince, logically. Like, duh. Also, I love, like, Brothers Grimm are kind of like, no, no, this is not grim enough. This is not too fucked up. But I just have a version where some parts of their body are chopped off. When she throws him onto the wall, she says, now you will have your peace, you disgusting frog. <laughs> But then he falls down, he's not a frog, but a prince with beautiful friendly eyes. There's no like conversation that they have had that night, like, you know, with this weird shit that just happened while, you know, he basically tried to rape her as a frog. No. And he was now, according to her father's will, her dear companion and husband. How, bitch? How, like, did you not explain the circumstances where this has happened? Does he not understand consent? This fucking story. So he tells her the enchanting version, yeah, that's not the way we could witch. She alone could have rescued him from the well. Great, great, all great. And tomorrow they would go together to his kingdom. Great, sounds legit. And then they fall asleep. What is going on? He is in your room. Who is this guy? You just had a frog. Now you have a human. Where is the consent? Why do you fall asleep next to a stranger? Oh my god, this story is so wrong in so many ways. Now who the fuck is Heinrich? Heinrich is his servant. Let me read this to you. Once again and then once again, the prince heard the cracking sound and thought that the carriage was breaking apart, but it was the bonds springing from faithful Heinrich's heart because his master was now redeemed and happy. Oh, such bullshit, I love it. <laughs> also, this one article that I read, like, moral of the story, is it that love hurts? Like, uh, what? <laughs> love should hurt and then somebody like appears in the true character is that your point or maybe this is kind of like a boogeyman story you know like you shouldn't let people into your fucking house and you shouldn't sleep with a stranger maybe no nope this was like <laughs> fucking prequel to tinder also nothing will ever convince me that brothers Grimm like weren't fucking constantly high and also that me and them wouldn't be just like the best of friends because they were fucking disturbed <laughs> That's it for this week, guys. Like, you know, I had a tough case and then I had to have, like, the most jokingly fucking mini for you. Now, as you are headed into your next fucking Zoom call, or I don't know if you started working from the office already and your company is just wrong, and then you have that meeting in person, in which case, how awkward. So, in that case, or any case, you go into that fucking meeting and you ask those people, do they know about any real story of Brothers Grimm behind these fucking fairy tales that have been embellished for kids now? So especially ask them parents, okay? These parents need to fucking know what is up. And especially ruin it for those like girly girls who are like, oh my god, Disney, I'm a princess. Those people that you have stalked and you have realized that they have like a history of dressing like a fucking Disney princess on Halloween. Yeah, those are the bitches that you target, okay? And you're like, oh, remember the one with the frog prince? Let me just destroy it for you real quick. And this is how you start up conversations, you know? This is how you start up conversations on consent. Especially, like, imagine if you actually read this story to your fucking kids, the Brothers Grimm old story, people would be like, yeah, this is wrong. Like, the kids would be like, no, you shouldn't, like, sleep with somebody who just turned from one person to the next. Well, from one animal to the other, but hey. 
even the kids would be like, no, did he get the permission to do this? Why is he here? Why is she suddenly still letting him be here? You know, why did she slap the shit out of a frog? Why is there abuse of an animal here? <laughs> I'm being such a literalist Linda, like, I'm like, oh, oh my god, listen. Let's take everything that these people have written literally to the word. Yep, yeah, that's it. You will go in and explain your colleagues how love hurts, but it's worth it afterwards. You know, your potential student that you're courting might hurt you badly. <laughs> you might need to blackmail them into, like, getting into their house, but hey, is it all worth it in the end? I don't fucking know. <laughs> It's up to your interpretation. It's been a long day, fuckers. I am out of here. You keep doing anything you need to do by all means necessary. But most importantly, you know why we are here. To make this world a better place. By all means necessary. One more day at a time. Let's do it. Goodbye, fuckers. Happy Monday. <laughs>